Hi everyone, I'm Mary, and today we're going to be looking at more of an excuse to see the murder ballerina of doom. This is Star Wars with Warhammer 40k episode 21, and did I mention the ballerina of doom? Yeah, because there's a mechanical ballerina of doom. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm stuck on this. It is weird, and I absolutely love everything about this. I never realized this is what this entire story needed, and now we have it. I'm just hoping that they don't get red shirted because they're a really cool character and they don't have plot armor because they're literally not on the star Wars side who have actual in build plot armor in the side of the force. Yeah. Works. Basically what I'm saying is I'm going to jump right in and see where this goes and hope the character who's really cool doesn't die. Which I've been warned happens a lot. Not like we've had any previous evidence of that. <laughs> uh, yeah. You guys know the deal. There's a link below to the original video. Hit it up. It's Fan. He's doing a great job. Do that. Let's get started. Meanwhile, back on the ranch. If they actually use the transition, I'm going to laugh my ass off. I don't expect it, but it would be hilarious. Where are we going to now? The Base artillery had it? stopped. Oh. It had just stopped. What? First, bit by bit, and then... All at once, Sando's ears throbbed in the that growing that silence, the like last volleys of precise death echoing still through and between the Axumite towers. He They're calling it Axum, so this is the Star Wars side, then if the artillery stopped, that means they're getting the reaction to Major Lazarus's charge from the Star, or sorry, the Imperial side, taking out the, oh, so they're just realizing that their artillery barrage just got unalived. Ah, they're not in a good place. Cool. He jumped and almost fell out of step as his brother spoke beside him, his voice loud in both the air and his earpiece, the comms having been required to talk and be heard at all only moments ago. Also, I like how one of the little hints that this is the Star Wars side is the music playing in the background being the Imperial March. So it's like, oh, there's an audio cue telling you exactly which side you're looking at right now, along with everything else. Because just without telling you, Who's talking without getting anything more than the name? You can place it exactly when it happened in the story because fans have been playing with time a bit. That's important. And you can also tell whose side you're talking about. That's just a few words in there that actually got a lot of information across that were not usually something you would think to add until it's too late and everyone's confused. Here, though, the information's there. But it's being delivered in a roundabout way that kind of works. That's just good writing. I'm actually a little jealous. I don't think I could pull that off if I tried. I guess the artillery crews found something better to shoot at, said Biskin, voice trembling. Nope. Sando nodded, but neither of them believed it. After all, they'd still hear the artillery firing at someone else if they were firing at yep. all. And they were not. For the moment, he and his platoon were marching in their column, the main body of the army shielded and allowed to progress at rapid pace by the vanguard forces the general had sent out ahead of their advance. And, of course, by the steady curtain of artillery fire. For minutes now, they had been watching the medivacs move back and forth from their line to the unseen fronts, delivering wounded and dead alike in numbers that chilled the clone. They had not started this close to the front. Oh, that's interesting. Usually, like, you can hear clones being a lot more, this is horrible, because they do have humanity, and that's one of the things that's on display a lot in the Clone Wars, at least the parts I've seen. Up until the switch gets flipped and they just... I don't actually know what happens after Order 66 because I made a point to ignore that. So don't spoil that for me, please. I know I'm talking about something that's been out for years. I'm weird. But more importantly, that's really cool that the humanity of it is actually getting to him just because of all the bodies. I guess this is a clone that has seen less action, isn't as hardened as the others, even though... I mean, he's still a clone. He's still going to be able to perform, but it's not something he's been actively exposed, exposed to. Wow, I can't exposed to so i guess he's the closest thing they have to green maybe i'm actually not sure how that would work but slowly more and more of the mainline platoons had been redeployed as vanguard support presumably as a response to severe losses yep sando looked around visors sweeping the front and sides of the vast roadway they were using to progress Vast was actually the wrong word for it, he would think as he took it in again. Expansive, gigantic, or even excessive would have been more accurate attributions. 
The road shrank and swelled at odd intervals as it was both joined by other smaller avenues for oh, one stretch so and then divided back down the avenue. next. At the current moment, it was easily large enough to accommodate two Venator-class Star Destroyers landing side by side, and still- Ah! I have severely underestimated just how big these roads are. I mean, I thought it was just a bunch of Bane Blades put together, which is not something I would ever say as a small number. I thought it was maybe like three abreast at max, which is huge! but not two Venator class Star Destroyer sizes. That is not a roadway. There are entire like plane docking hangars, airports that could not do that. That is not a roadway. That is a football field taken to the extreme and played on jetpacks and still having extra space. Although, having said that out loud, if they actually had something about football with jetpacks, I would actually watch the sport for once. And I'm not sure if I mean soccer or American football. Take your pick. Both would be awesome with jetpacks. I stand by my statement. Still have a bit of room to spare. Initially, the road had been bare and clear, with only a surprisingly oh, light geez. spattering of civilian vehicles and wrecks, and almost no residual <laughs> damage from the invasion prior. Now, however, they were marching over ground that you know, I just realized they use flying cars for everything. Like speeders are even common on Tatooine to the point where you could see them. But this place has physical roads that they could walk on. I don't know. I just, that's weird. That's weird for me. It's not a huge issue. I don't actually know the mechanics of the spear well enough to know if it can go this high, but. Huh. Just. In hindsight, it's just. Maybe it's just a stylistic thing? It's probably a stylistic thing. Either way, it's a cool one, but... Huh. The vanguard and artillery had fought and cleared ahead of them. The once straight streams of marching men found their lines distorted as clones picked their ways around piles of corpses, burning tanks, smoldering craters, and hastily assembled barricades and broken hardpoints. They're walking through the ruins the of the The smell ambush, of huh? death and the breath of countless weapons was already tainting the air with its familiar musk and Sando shuddered. He had thought it would be impossible for the terrain of Azure City to spark memories of the Shadow World campaign. Oh? The ARC trained troop- Okay, I'm just gonna be the flat out person on this. Flat out person. Uh, flat out about? I don't know what the Shadow campaign is. If this is something that came up in the Clone Wars that I just missed, I'm gonna be off base on this. Or if it's something from one of the books, I haven't read them. I started keeping up with Legends, and then I switched over to Disney. I kind of didn't read anything. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them. I haven't read them. Can't say. Cooper felt the eerie silence around them thicken and become familiar, only disturbed by the sounds of their own walkers and footfalls and the occasional distant echoes of battle. The clouds rolled in around them and hid the sun, shrouding their path in obscuring sheets of cold rain. It was a different darkness, a different foe, but it was the same war. He gripped <laughs> no. his blaster more tightly. Oh, that's... Oh, okay. I thought he's just making a comparison, but with how he's talking about it and talking about how it's bringing him back to a previous campaign, I, I don't think this is so much fan showing us a guy remembering something as a guy who's on the edge of a panic attack going through full PTSD memory overlap. This is a clone that is mentally scarred. I thought he was green, but I think it, the other, it, it's not even that he's not green. He's a veteran and he's just done with this shit because it's just kind of fucked up. Huh? Don't know if I've seen that kind of characterization before. Again, it could be something that happens in Clone Wars. I haven't finished that yet. I need to get on that. Why haven't I? Because I'm easily distracted. That's why. Yeah. Body gloves squeaking slightly under the plates of his battle armor. He was bred for war, bred from war. A sliver, a shard of the galaxy's greatest fighter hammered into the shape of a soldier. Yet he still always, but they're not always an assassin droid. This. The dread, 
the yawning mouth of death taunting him, his every step forward a promise that his short life was growing shorter and shorter. He wondered if those sensations, those feelings of fear, were meant to sharpen him, to make him stronger, make him better at surviving, I mean, or at Krieg, preventing the enemy's survival. Part. Sando couldn't know, but he hoped it was the case, particularly when the captain began to issue new orders, oh. orders the clone had heard issued many times before. Two Fire. platoons further up the line of the column. They were being redeployed, being sent to the vanguard. Dark rumbles of thunder framed the orders as they were given, like mm. ominous portents, and once more Sando could hear Death's grinning, hungry mouth taunt him. Dude. This time, Sando, I'll have you this time. Okay, fan, what the fuck, man? You know, there's two things I need to say about that voice. One, that is incredibly creepy. Like, Wow, I'm actually surprised Fan is pulling out that good of a creepy voice on a character's internal monologue and not an actual character. And two, it is so creepy and so distinct. It just highlighted, oh shit, Fan's mic got a lot better. Early on, it was capping out constantly. And it, I think it's done intentionally for some of the people who are getting a more of a mechanical effect. So I think he actually lowered his cap out level and then up the volume on them as an effect intentionally. But moments like this, it's like, Oh, no, yeah, no. Nah. His equipment is noticeably better. And I just noticed that because of how much this voice stood out. The rest of it had happened so gradually, it just kind of felt natural to hear it. I didn't even notice. So hearing it now is just, it's just jarring enough to trigger the rest of that brain process. I'm sure someone else would have noticed it a lot faster, but I'm an idiot. So let's go with that. It chuckled in his mind. He gave it no response, instead saluting with his brothers and following his orders. They picked up their pace, marching ahead of the column for a few minutes before a couple of modified ISP speeders pulling hover sleds arrived. He and his squad boarded one, cramming themselves in and taking their seats on the uncomfortable thin planks of metal that served the purpose, strapping in. The clones slid their long rifles between their legs, holding them there, barrels in their hands, and aimed up as the ISPs tore off at a brisk pace, jerking them all and making Sando fear that the sleds would topple, as he did every time. And as every time before, the repulsor lifts mounted to the sleds compensated for the pitch, aligning them behind the speeders as a city blurred around them rain. Yeah, I, I just I love this entire thing. Fan is doing something that a lot of people it wrong he's giving scenery detail but he's filtering it through someone's perspective that's the part the part i should mention specifically is what they get wrong is usually talking about how he got into a sled it was made of a very thin metal and it's just rickety enough that he thinks it's going to break but it's just sturdy enough that it didn't he didn't collapse he didn't fall out it didn't flip now that is how fans do it. This is done well because he's incorporating a person to smooth out certain things. So you don't have to describe every little nook and detail and every little fold or bit of the metal to show that it's really fucked up or that it looks rickety or how the shape of it is. Because that is a problem people run into so much when they go into detail overload, when they're trying to build a scene, they're talking about like, oh yes, the sun was rising. The wolves were howling. It was a weird situation. And even that last bit right there saying it's a weird situation is that extra piece that is not included because it's just, here is a thing to see. Here is another thing to see. They're not writing a novel. They're writing a movie description that could then be given as a guidance to a filmographer who would then ignore it because they know better what to do than the person writing that. It's because people write as if they're watching a movie and describing what they see in their head. It's a very easy trap to fall into. I know I've done it plenty of times. But this, though, is how you get around that. You have little bits and pieces that you see, and then you don't just say that. You filter it through how the character is interacting with it. And that is really well done because... Most people don't do that. I'm not just talking fan fiction writers, like fan. I'm not just talking low-level romance writers because, goddamn, the more you know about that, that is not writing. That is literally and mad libs. 
No, no, there's nothing else. It, there's literally actual forms. It's like, here is the sex scene. Here is the romance. Here is the fight. And you just have to fill it out in a ex very exact length. And once you get good at it, it is literally a Mad Lib, just a little bigger than you expect. Pulp fiction romance novels are incredibly formulaic. And if you don't do it, there's issues. I previously did an entire internship in a small publishing house, and I saw some of the forms. It is... It's so easy, you'd think everyone would do it. But it's also a very cutthroat market. Don't get into that. Just don't. The only thing more dangerous to get into would be children's lit. Specifically the picture books. Rabid. Don't. Or was I? Oh yeah, just talking about how the imitations of really good writing versus what fans doing and just is actually good writing. I get stuck on the literary aspects and it's really fun. Pain smacking their helmets. They were briefed over their comms, the voice of a sergeant loud and clear as he relayed what had been told to him over to the rest of the squads. Their mission was simple. They were joining the rest of their platoon in a flanking assault on an enemy hardpoint. Oh, Some of the against? imps had assembled a competently placed gun nest and were holding well past the point they should have been overtaken. I know it's kind of weird to say this considering there is only one technical empire yet, but every time I hear imps... I keep thinking stormtroopers, not clones. Uh, and I know it's way too early for that, but it's in my head first because I was a Star Wars fan first. So when I hear Imperial, I think stormtroopers. I think the Galactic Empire. I don't think the 40K side, even though I know more about 40K and they are the only empire right now. Just it, in my head, I have to actually physically go in there and go, nope, fix it. It's a little annoying. I have to cut out a lot, but it happens. Despite their relatively low numbers, casualties from the vanguard forces which had attempted to storm the position had been disproportionately high, and the Imperials showed oh, no mercy to the 13, fractured 13 remains was? of their blunted assaults. Sando 13, 13. and the rest were oh, going to take a building 13, that the Imperials 13, had the placed their backs to and split into two but teams. Yeah, it was probably his little team foxhole. Team 1 would set charges behind the imps, while Team 2 took the roof and rappelled down on top of the enemy positions, firing all the while. And this would also place it so we're not actually seeing 13's entire assault because we saw the assault on him before the guns cut out. And if they're going to a hard point, it's probably that. Although it could be someone else. I kind of hope it's someone else because if it's against 13 right now, 13 may or may not be dead or this character is because he's brand new. We're seeing what the assault looks like from their perspective. But either way, it's anchoring that into right after we just saw 13. Okay. Sorry, just fan is playing around with times and showing scenes in very tight coordination right now. And it's kind of cool just figuring out where every piece looks. What the hell his notes look like to keep track of this? I kind of want to picture that because it has to be complex already. And I've been told this is the easy part. It gets bigger and more what the fuck inducing. If someone actually has a picture, I'd appreciate that. There's a link in my Discord if you can just share it there. I'd really like that. I, I'm not even joking. That would be awesome. It was imperative that they crushed this resistance on this attempt, as anything else would either stall the advance or force the main columns to become mm. engaged as they came into contact with the hard point. Sando hoped this was the reason a whole platoon was being sent in and not just a few How squads, big is a platoon? or better yet, some commandos. You know, I probably should have known that considering Whatever point, the reason, really they were disembarking near the rear of the targeted building mm. all too soon. The troopers stood and armed, preparing, squads separating to different entry points, priming breaching charges, checking windows, and synchronizing mission timers. Sando found himself pressed against the white steel of the wall beside a window. The glass had been scanned, brittle, so he knew he'd get through it without any trouble. Oh. The countdown was snapped Are out, they going out the window? Ear, and or shooting out of it. once, he watched as his brothers smashed the window clear before he propelled himself into motion. Okay, yeah, they're jumping his the armor window. protected him from the glass shards as he tossed himself over the lip of the breach and into the shadowed confines of the building. Damn. The sound of breaching charges rung out as he crossed. Lights of dim, stormy gray lancing oh, into the down. dark structure before rifle-mounted lights activated. He and his platoon stormed in, covering each other as they advanced at rapid pace. He came to the rectangular 13, entrance into one hallway doing. and checked, crisp lamp light illuminating the space ahead of his brothers as they passed him and continued in. And for the briefest moment, 
just a moment, Sando dared to hope that the Imperials had left the building vacant. Nope. That they had left their backs exposed. Then came the explosions. Sando was, it was a trap back out of the hallway on a concussive wave, no more than a piece of errant phlegm coughed out of a dragon's throat. Damn. His mind was sent scattering, and while he never truly lost they consciousness, the he lay just where they stunned, were motionless as chaos erupted around him. The imps had not relied on their minds alone to take care of all the clones and drove into the stunned or destroyed point man. Okay, so that was just an forces. opening breaching shot, though. Bright bursts of red and yellow light trapping flashing down hallways and corralling the more numerous enemy squads away from their planned trajectories. Voices were shouting, clones and Imperials. Weapons fire heated the air and filled it with the sour fumes of spent munitions and scorched air. Distantly, he knew that they had been ambushed, that the Imperial Hardpoint had been a trap. But those thoughts were difficult to grasp and keep, Ooh. a recurring epiphany of the worst kind. After some time... This is a bit of a aside, but... Does anyone know that music he's playing in the background? Because I don't recognize that song, and I feel like I've heard it somewhere before, but I can't place it. It's bugging me more than a little bit, because it's good and it fits... And it has that amped up feeling of, oh, to give you that really deep resonant feeling of this is a very important moment. But it also has a nice, almost depressive effect to show that even though it's an amped moment, it's an amped moment that you know is going to go bad, which is exactly the kind of mood he's going for. So basically, I want to know what it is because it, it, it's good reading music for later for me. That's my only reason. Also, goddamn fan, you're making some really good choices when it comes to background music right now. It has great emotional impact that just fits what you need and is adding a lot of cues that you don't even need to write in at that point. I wonder if you have to take that into account when you write it. Know that you don't need to write something because you're going to add an extra cue on an audio level. I, if anything, I would actually just like to ask him right now what his writing process is. I'm actually very curious. How much Sando had no way to tell, he sat up slowly and looked around. The explosions had thrown him out of the hallway and into a room somewhere. The complex they were fighting in seemed to be some kind of office building, and he had collided with a desk, collapsing it and half burying himself in white paper. His body Did ached paper? from hair to toenails, huh. and he felt sick, but Weird. at the sound of the alien imperial tongue, all those sensations began to bleach away. His translator was busted, so he had no way of knowing what the imps were saying as they drew nearer and nearer to the room. Probably but something he along the lines of poor the emperor. himself from where he had landed and, ignoring the pain protest of his limbs, crouched by the open door, watching and listening in. Finding his visor cracked and thereby obscured, he removed his helmet and placed it down next to him as he waited and watched. Ooh. The fighting was still going on, but well, it was 40K farther standards, away he's now. He's immortal and now. This area had certainly fallen behind the enemy's line. Two Imperials were strolling down the hallway, speaking to each other and casually executing any clones they found still breathing. As so they a lot did. of the other ones didn't make it. Sando felt rage build in his chest, but looking around, failed to spot where his rifle was resting. The two imps came to stand near his door, pausing just beyond. A trooper, half buried in the rubble from the wall beside him, groaned as they stepped onto the detritus which hid him. With a gesture and a chuckle, one of the soldiers kicked away some of the collapsed and shattered panels, exposing the Republic trooper's cracked helmet. Help! The clone groaned. Nope. The Imperials looked at each other and shrugged, one leveling his laser rifle down towards the clone. But it was the man behind him who cried out, the Imperial gasping out a scream of alarm before his breath was driven out of him by Sando's tackle. The oh, so he actually physically got into combat. That actually is probably the one time where this will work out better because they probably have a lot more CQC training than most average Imperials. Because the people who would get into close combat are not going to be in the army. Minus the sergeants who are insane. Clone pinned people. the man to the wall, grabbing him roughly by his thick shoulder plate and pulling. 
It was in this way that he was able to spin the man around in time to catch the other Imperial's volley of energy blasts. Yeah, which had been fired not down at the injured clone, but instead back towards Sando himself. Energy blast? Oh, so it's not the gonna soldier punch cried either. out in despair as he inadvertently shot his comrade, not killing the man, but further stunning the breathless Imperial Sando held Ooh. locked in his arms. The clone wasted no time, reacting on instinct more than training, using his left hand to find the wounded man's holstered sidearm, yanking it free and pulling the trigger. Goddamn! Sando almost cried out for joy as he found the weapon without its safety engaged, spears of red light punching into the other soldier's chest and face. The dying. This might sound weird, but I'm actually wondering do Imperial weapons in 40k have safeties? I, I know this is a weird thought because it's like it's 40k everything's going to kill you and everything's somewhat badly designed no they won't but at the same time i don't it's just, that's such a it's a practical part of a device that makes absolute sense which is why i'm wondering if they would actually have it in 40k just to hype up the grim darkness of it because that's kind of 40k's thing here's something stupid and useful we're not using it I know that's a weird thing to stick on, but I'm actually curious if anyone knows if that has been referenced in any official media before, because I just, it would be funny to me if it turned out, no, no, we don't have safeties here. We want people to accidentally shoot themselves. It builds character. You know, I said that's kind of a joke, but at the same time, I could fully believe 40K doing that. Huh. Dying man fired with a spray of his own red light, but falling to one knee, Sando managed to catch all yep. the shots that would Sando have struck is definitely him a on his human a veteran. shield. He smirked for just a moment as the man before him dropped to the ground, trigger still squeezed and discharging lasers into the wall beside him for several seconds. Oh. But soon, the clone hissed instead and tossed off his Imperial human shield. The man had done nothing to him. He was quite thoroughly dead after the last volley. Damn. His body, riddled with so many shots, had become so hot that Sando had started to feel his neck and shoulder heating painfully. What the? He took only a. No, literally. How the hell do you heat up a body that much that you could feel it through? I'm assuming armor meant for lasers. A and yet it's not on fire. I'm assuming it's just weird imperial tech. Let's just, let's just go with that. Yeah, 40k has weird shit. A moment then to pull his fallen brother out from Ooh, the detail, rubble then. and lay him within the room among the papers. But Sando could hear more of the imps coming. Stealing guns now? He grit his teeth, swirls of dread and rage and raw hatred flitting through him. Ooh. And then the insanity took him. The insanity that always took him when he managed to get his blood up and pumping. What? He hated that it had to come from this, but once it came at all, he couldn't help the emotions he felt. Some of his brothers inherited their gene father's natural talent with machines. Others, his penchant for creative thinking and command. And others still harbored Django's keen eyes or his thirst for victory at any cost. Uh, why does this sound like Django gave some of his clones the Black Rage? normally be like oh okay he's a berserker cool but considering this is the 40k introduction here and fan has stated that the warp and the force are more or less the same just the warp is the corrupted oh my god what the fuck is wrong with it version I i'm wondering if this is actually evidence that Django passed on spiritual aspects as well because everything's tied into the force it's not even that weird of a thought Sorry, just this is a really cool detail because this definitely sounds, from a 40k perspective, like someone who's about to do psychic bullshit, tapping into it some way, shape, or form. And I don't know if that's the case, but if it is, that is really big because that would imply that there's a significant amount of psychers potentially in a clone population. probably not going to be a thing but that would be very interesting if things ever progress far enough for that to be brought up i just don't know yet but that's really a cool thought process but sando in these moments felt that he had inherited much more than any of his brothers had 
Django had Hell been the most lethal bounty hunter in were. the history of the galaxy, and Sando had inherited his father's killer instincts. Those impulses, desires, and emotions which compelled one being to simply understand. He says anything about blood for a blood god, so help and me. By what means to do it. He struggled to explain it to his brothers, and they struggled to understand quite what it was about him that made him the way he was. But Sando had no difficulty in this. Sounds like he definitely inherited something Not beyond once he was mortal. in the zone, so to speak. And here, behind enemy lines. Also, I just noticed the background music that I thought was really a nice dirge early on. It just changed a bit. It's still playing, but it has a different vibe to it. It's less mournful and more resolute sounding now. Seriously, man. Fan picked an absolutely great bit of background here because it did transfer from that dirge of everything's going wrong, but it's a serious fight, to everything went wrong and I'm here to play out my Doom Guy fantasy by fucking you up. And it works. Alone, without his weapon and injured, he was most certainly feeling as though he had found his zone once more. The clone looked around, eyes razor sharp. He spotted his fallen brother's blaster rifle intact and ignored it, bending oh. down beside the two Imperial corpses and yanking gear from their Because their bodies. guns are stronger. Grenades, a rifle, two pistols, and a long, wickedly curved knife Damn. came away with his red-tinged hands. And he wasted no time in strapping them around his body. Gear doing in something place, a rifle lot of 40K in hand, won't do. Sando paused to listen, Not all of them. feeling the hard thrum but of lethal intention pulling on every fiber of his finite gun. being. It took him a second or three, but soon he had a sense of where the Imperials were and moved off in that direction. He crept, staying low, legs burning as he maintained a steady stride, weapon up and ready. He saw that there was a flashlight attached to the end of his gun, but didn't activate it. His eyes had become accustomed to the darkness by now. Oh. And for that, he was able to see the flashes of muzzle fire clearly in the doorway of his destination, as well as hear the sounds. Because they're not Astartes, he's fighting. He came closer, they probably and, closer wouldn't have the and within his that. mind, an ocean of thoughts swirled, clawing at the purity of his purpose. Run! His animal instincts screamed into him. But it was not to those instincts that Sando was listening. Within every Mandalorian lived a beast, a fiend, because a demon clones of war. Yeah. It was a ghastly thing, a killing thing, and it was to this thing that Sando now lent all his attention. And I'm not the only one hearing this and thinking, that sounds, um, not entirely normal. Like, am I misreading this? Is it my entire thinking, okay, this is some kind of force effect. I, I don't know why, but this sounds, um, I think the term is sus as fuck. I don't know if that's going to be important or not, but it's very much a description we haven't had before. But it sounds like someone in Star Wars side who's tapped into the dark side without being a Jedi. Or a Sith, I guess. But I don't... Were there ever instances of clones doing that? I honestly have no idea. And as he crossed the final few feet to the entryway that led to the battle... It screamed its first comprehensible order into his ear, its ringing command driving out all other thoughts of demon. any other kind. Run! And he obeyed, picking up speed and almost throwing himself through the doorway. Awaiting him on the other side Run was a two-story lobby, open and tiered. The Imperials were engaging a retreating clone force Ew. here, having taken most of the room already. This is older art, isn't it? Emerging from behind them, Sando squeezed down on his desire to roar with all his might, the killer in him tamping down on the natural reaction. Instead of yelling a war cry, he dashed behind the first cluster of Imperials and opened fire. The weapon in his arms kicked oddly, the recoil soft, like an exhaling breath, nothing close to what he got from a DC-16. Oh. And that helped Heavy him weapons. drill holes into the backs of their heads as he sighted it down. It didn't fire like a blaster either, issuing a spray of red and orange bolts, like an indication laser being set to strobe. The way they seemed to bounce off the back of the Imperial's helmets, at least for the first few shots, made the weapon feel strangely weak in his hands. 
Yet, when he corrected his aim for the last of the three, citing oh. his exposed neck, the clone was shocked to find the Imperial handedly decapitated in less time than it took for him to realize what had happened. Yeah, what did just happen? Because force field, and it might just be a different person. What kind of weapon just glances off flak armor, though? It wasn't weak, he realized. It wasn't any kind of firearm at all. It was a death laser gun. What? Like a strobing flashlight of pure murder made into the shape of a rifle. He knew... God, they just... They act... <laughs> Normally, when you call a last gun a flashlight, <laughs> it's a joke because it's a flashlight. He's turning it on and off. It's weak as hell. But on the Star Wars side, it's a flashlight of murder, which is the exact same description, but kind of hyped. Oh, my God. I just I love how it's actually the same term, probably for a las gun as well. But it's completely different meaning. <laughs> oh, sorry, that. That's just perfect, man. Knew not why, but the realization tore a grin into his face. Though neither did he pause to consider it, moving quickly to the next two Imperials. Perhaps because of his speed, or the fact that the gun he was firing was their own, the Imperials had yet to realize the because wolf it probably in sounds their midst. Different. And he caught the next two unprepared. And there's so many shots he you don't He scythed off the head it. of the first just as the second turned around, sliding at the he weapon's has cartridge a lot as he did and started to reload even as Imperium. his eyes met Sando's. Hostilit! He started to scream before Sando filled his jaws with atomizing light. Damn. But dead as the man was, his call had succeeded, and the dozen or so Imperials in the room swung to regard the commotion. Oh no. He was moving even before then, Grenades. all too aware of how easy a target he was in white armor and using the smooth steel pillars on the Imperial side of the room to hide from the spatters of returning fire those that spotted him sent his way. Sando kept his head down, running in a crouch and raising his gun, firing it over his head and providing his own covering fire for the second or two he needed to close the distance of the next pair of soldiers. He passed the last pillar and came into naked view of the two, one of whom was still firing at Sando's brothers on the opposite side of the room, while the oh, so other had his survivors. gun leveled at the approaching clone. The trooper felt his teeth almost crack, pushing his legs so hard he was sure his limbs would burst. All the while knowing that if they didn't, it still would not be enough. The Imperial opened fire, and Sando yeah. reflexively tossed the rifle in his arms at the enemy. Hey, Everything what? seemed to slow, time grinding gun down up? to a halt. He saw the rifle spinning in the air, saw the bolts of light, lightning quick even now, streaking towards him. But as the first bolts hit the rifle, they did not budge it. They only burned it it wasn't until the scorched air collapsed around the impact shots that any actual physical force was applied to the gun in the air oh, no. and in those fragments of seconds it ate too many of the soldiers shots and sando found himself shielded in the shadow of the gun he'd thrown seriously if the force is not at work in this i don't know what the hell is because he literally dodged bullets by throwing a gun that would take it this is like force precognition levels of bullshit here. This is not instinct. This is like, well, I mean, the only time I know this would be instinct is if we were going to like the Fate franchise where instinct is an actual definable way to see how someone reacts. It's that level of conceptual bullshit going on right here. So there's something up with him. This is way beyond skill. This is moving to the beat of something controlling him so he knows what beat it is coming before it actually happens. Honestly, it's really cool to see done this way because it's not talking about all the crazy force powers that you get when you talk to Jedi or get into a Jedi's head to see, oh yeah, I did all this stuff. It's just someone acting in a way that looks like the force is guiding them without ever having that thought process. It's actually really cool to see. Even as he drew the two pistols from his waist, the weapon burst in the air and Sando smelled the unpleasant waft of burning plastic and scorched meat as the two red lances caught him, one on his left shoulder and the other on his left leg. Ooh. The armor there blackened, lightened, 
but held as he leapt. And that's all that matters. Sando drove for the man's knees, colliding with his shins instead, and causing the Imperial to collapse. Pitched forward over the clone as Sando raised his weapon. From the ground, he opened fire, spraying the other occupied soldier with twin barrels of red death. The man dropped, but not before the first soldier on top of Sando mm. spun himself around, kicking the clone hard in the head and sending his aim wide. Likely, in this instant, range and rate of fire made up for his split vision. Pain brought him back to focus, the soldier having twisted onto his back while still on top of Sando, firing shots from his laser gun down at the clone's exposed head. Oh. <laughs> God damn. I think this is one of those crazy times where I could actually say this fight is more intense than some of the actual Jedi fights we've seen so far. It's weird because I thought the highlight fight would be against the Space Marine Librarian. And that one, admittedly, was really cool. But the nature of it is so incredibly different where that fight was a showpiece to show what a Marine Librarian could do against all the Jedi. It's a power demonstration as all the fights up to it were slowly leading. Here it's going back down to the low level of what would happen if someone is just fighting. But it's a highly competent soldier who's been very scarred and probably getting the same access to the force to just do what needs to be done. Because there's this is way too many levels of bullshit for just instinct. Oh my god. It's kind of an entirely hype fight, but on such a much lower level that it's somehow more relatable. It's just, it's a different type of cool, but it's still cool. A bolt of heat scoured the right side of Sando's face, and he ducked his head, avoiding the direct hits which would have more than burned him. He almost hesitated, but in the midst of pain and fear, training took over. He dropped his pistols and half spun, half reached around as quickly as he could, oh? grasping the man's legs and then twisting them both. Flipping over hard so that he was on top and the Imperial beneath him and now face down, you see unable training? to shoot yeah. for a few precious moments. Sando rolled up towards the man's back, pinning him to the cold ground with one arm while his other hand reached for the dagger he had taken earlier. The Imperial beneath him did not pause or cease resistance, however, curling his legs under him and rising in a rush, both slamming the back of his hard oh, helmet into the clone's fighting. face and pitching him off. The Imperial soldier scrambled forward as Sando fell back, gasping as he pulled his knife free of the belt holster he'd taken, raising it up. But the man was already too far from him, collapsing out of against range the pillar and using it for support as he spun around. Back sliding up as gun? he stood, gun barrel Thought rising it. towards Sando's chest. On his knees and barely able to see through his distorted vision, the clone threw his dagger, aiming for the man's face. The honed blade hummed through the air, its monomolecular edge slicing past atoms before burying itself a half inch into the hard, torso encompassing armor over the Imperial's chest. Not enough. Not nearly oh. close enough. Sando let his arm. Thought he would have had it there. Limp, barely able to see the soldier smirk past. <laughs> We've had so many ass pulls so far that you think, okay, something's guiding him. He's just going to get it. Neck. Nope. It made it in, but it's not enough. I, I love this. The entire description there is great because it's building on what we already experienced, seeing how he's just pulling it out one after the other. And instead of following that trope of the entirely competent badass, he gets to make a mistake or he just doesn't get it far enough or his luck doesn't quite hold. And now something is going to happen rather than him just cakewalking through it. It's that difference between an OC that's just kind of cringy and a character who you want to deal with. Because this way, even if they're built up as a badass and kind of broken, which Sando basically has obscene levels of instinct. Instinct. It's not perfect, and this is the way to show that. So it's actually making him a little more believable because he's not just one-shotting everyone by pure luck. Even just that moment early on, like knowing what to do with his training, to get in there and get into the close quarters and to pull out the knife, all of that, after a while, that heavy, perfect competence, I survived, would wear on someone. But 
in this situation because there's just that little moment of, oh shit, it didn't work. It gives more leeway for whatever is about to happen next, whether it's to end him as a character and then move to a different viewpoint or to have something else happen to be either saving him or to have him pull it out. I'd personally lean more towards the last one myself. It's his own blurred but clearing sight. Katie Sussepit! The man growled, I have no idea what and is. then Probably his head him. burst, a bright blue blaster bolt taking him from the left side. He dropped like a sack of drowned porgs, and Sando, who could barely register his drowned continued porgs, existence, really? found himself gasping and alive. He looked around, eyes focusing, and began to understand. As he had made his assault, so too had the battle around them been persisting and progressing. Though and the had Imperials had been blindsided by Sando's rampage, the clones fighting them had noticed him <laughs> from the start. Emboldened by his assault and aided by the quick felling of five of the enemy's soldiers, several yep. of the other Republic troopers had taken the initiative, charging in through the gap and beginning a building flanking maneuver. A clone ran to where Sando knelt, offering him a hand, which the trooper took with a wince. He could feel the burns on his face beginning to assert their reality, Ooh, and I was relieved burns, when the man handed him a back to pack. Kote, brother, said the clone, and though he okay. wore a helmet still, Sando could tell that the trooper was smiling beneath it. Vodan, Sando said in response, taking one of the fallen Imperials' oh, rifles language. and setting his jaw. The clone took only a few moments rest to apply his Bacta before charging in to aid in the fight. Though the Imperial resistance was stubborn, he and the clones he'd found managed to plunge deep into the gap they'd created. Cut off, but with a clear shot to their mission objective, the clone troopers of the Republic grimly pressed on. They had been three quarters of the way to their destination when Sando and his men got word of other squads breaking through. Not the the ones. Imperials appeared to be withdrawing bit by bit. Though the they other clones rallied at the thought of being now. the first yeah. at the scene, not the only ones, Sando kept his optimism in check. The imps were rabid. Every last one. He shuddered to think what could actually be happening to force such forces into a withdrawal. He began to feel as he had. Now that is a very leading line. Normally my thought process here would be, okay, they achieved their objective. They got rid of the artillery. They can pull back, consolidate, and move forward as more coherent unit. That though, that line is important because... It, one, shows that I haven't been completely off base when I thought was happening. Two, what would cause the Imperials... Wow, I keep doing that. No, it actually was right this time. The Imperials to pull back when they have just achieved a beachhead. When they... Or not a beachhead, but like a good position to fight from. They have taken out the enemies and they're pulling them away from the other forces. Did Lazarus get new orders? Did something happen in the background? Is an enemy attacking them somewhere else where they need to pull back now that their main objective has been completed? I don't know. But because Fan had someone say that line that... Oh, I'll just pull it up again. ...to force such forces into a withdrawal. Because he's flat out stating something... Uh, he didn't want to know what that something is would have forced them into with withdrawal. That means a play for power has happened somewhere. And considering the beginning of this episode, it's one of two things. It's either the death ballerina, but I really doubt that. Or that crazy ass, definitely not chaos sorcerer inquisitor is doing shit. And they're just GTFOing because they don't know how to deal with it. And may or may not be called in to help. I don't know which one it is. And it could also be a third option of thing. I don't know about yet. But I wouldn't have expected that except for the fact that he's lampshading. And this does sound like lampshading because you wouldn't say, oh, something had to do this. If that's not the author just giving you the wink and not going, hey, I got a plan. You're not going to see it coming. Get ready for it, though. It's a really good way to just build that little bit of suspense and to leave breadcrumbs for the reader that something is about to go down. It, I think from a technical standpoint, so far, this episode is incredibly... Well made. 
He began to feel as he had when he'd awoken to find his squad missing or dead, and his chances of survival essentially foregone. And that, Sando knew, was not a good thing. Mm. Yet they reached the position without further conflict, locating the precise place on the wall where they were to set their charges. Sando had the men spread out and form a small perimeter, while the demo specialists had their fun with the shaped charges. The clone had advised them to lay it on thick. He hoped they could take out the imp hardpoint just by the force of their entry, if possible. Doubt it. The best case scenario would be for them to be able to create their own exit through their former position. And the worst would be to get caught between that hardpoint's back and a dedicated assault from the imps still in the building. It was at this time that Sando and the others learned that the roof access teams were almost in position and that their reinforcements were only minutes away. Oh. The clone almost dared to relax. What building are they and breaching then into? It started happening. What? At first, it wasn't obvious, but when 10 minutes rolled by and no sign of their reinforcements had arrived, the clones began checking in what? just to be safe. Gone. Half the squads were just gone everyone was ordered to check in and for only short intervals to be taken in between but oh so that is what fans doing the reason i'm pausing is because i went on that entire commentary point about how sando is being built up as a badass but showing he's still in perk so you can believe what he does great and so when someone saves him, it's like, oh, yeah, no, he's not like a Mary Sue, perfect character. He's about to die or survive a near-death experience. It could go either way at this point. But we're about to be exposed to something different from the Imperial side. And considering it's the Imperial side, that could be any number of horrors. I don't know which one is going to go. It could be the crazy ballerina, but I really doubt it because I don't think getting out of there would really suit the narrative so well because there were so many other parts in play to that which means that it's either a new thing altogether that we haven't heard of yet or the inquisitor is making a move and they were pulling back because he probably has people in positions to just do what he wants or it could just be a third thing where i just have no idea what it is yet but this only highlighted the dread inducing speed of the phenomenon as clones continue to vanish Sando's platoon, Vanish? or what was left of it, acted quickly, moving to seal off as many of the incoming access points as they could, closing them and rigging them with traps as quickly as they could manage. All the while, it? small hints and haunting pieces of the puzzle began to emerge over the radios. The sounds of thundering weapons could be heard, drawing nearer and nearer. Special forces and the incomplete kind? screams and war cries of the assailed began to bleat out from their open comms. The clones managed to lock down a great deal of the surrounding rooms, powering doors with spare energy cells and barricading what was left, until they managed to narrow down the most likely approach to a single short hallway. Yeah. Sando and half the men were tasked with holding it until the explosives were all Oh my god, they're literally doing the Vader introduction scene. You have a hallway where an enemy that you don't know, but you're having built up is coming down. You could hear the tension in the description saying they're coming this way. You're in this hallway and it's an unknown monster. This is literally the introduction of Vader, Vader. Wow. Vader from a new hope. That moment of just him walking through and right behind all of the clones just overwhelming the enemies and just have that presence of oh shit they're the bad guys and they're serious that's how you introduce the imperial wow the empire in the first star wars fourth star wars movie you know what i mean and now we're getting that exact moment for whatever is about to happen here and i'm assuming it's probably the inquisitor but it could also be a few other people as well set and lit and in that darkness beside his brothers he waited but despite how much time seemed to drag as he listened to their soft, shuffling and nervous breaths, even he realized that they were not left waiting for long. Oh. Thunk, thunk, thunk. Metal? The unmistakable sound of hard metal footfalls began to fill the space. Might be 
Murder the talk, acrid murder smell murder. of weapons fire slowly gave way to the heady scent of alien incense. Incense? Sando could see it. The thin lines and trails of smoke growing thicker and thicker from the shadows where he crept. I have no idea what that would be. Thunk. 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 He swallowed hard, feeling his heart pounding painfully in his chest. He could feel the vibrations in the ground just ever so slightly as the specter of death approached. This is time, Sando. I told you I'd have you this time. Whispered the wet lips of death. Bitter sweat slicked the inside of his bodysuit, and he gripped (laughs) the Imperial Deathlight more tightly. He knelt behind a set of overturned desks, weapon braced and sighted down the long hallway. Thunk. Thunk. And then a pause. The clones froze, held their breaths, and waited. But as... Oh, this is so well done. It's building up the tension, but it's also not dragging it out. Mostly because there's that moment of it felt like a long time, but it wasn't. That's actually part of the dialogue that we heard that, well, not the dialogue, but the description about how this is how his mind's working. It's stretching it out because of the tension. He's now going back to what I thought was PTSD initially or being green thinking, oh, yeah. That's as close. I'm going to get to that accent. I'm going to stop it there. Hearing the death voice in his head. They're building the tension so well here. They're building up a monster in the dark. And it is becoming terrifying because we saw how competent he is. So when he's scared, it gives it credibility that it wouldn't have had if we had just immediately got, oh, hey, here's a monster. As before, they did not have to wait long before the angels descended upon them. And Sando was tested Angels? against an untestable foe. Space Marines? Oh, you son of a bitch! We got to a partial reveal. We got to the angels descending on them. It's like, if there's one thing described as an angel in most of 40k, it's usually his angels of death. The freaking Space Marines. I didn't realize there was, a, I thought there was just like a handful there. We're getting to finally see Space Marine combat and we're going somewhere else. It's infuriating because we've had it teased so many times, but it's either been in the shadows. We see the space Marines fight or with the one chapter master where it's just a game to him. And he just lined them up for a perfect slice all the way through showing that the droids were not a threat, but it's also not a fight at that point. It was play and intimidation for an overly competent combatant or all done in the shadows to see what would go on. We haven't seen space marine combat and we're still not because it's right there against someone who we know is competent. So it's building up what the enemy is doing versus what the space marines are going to fight against to show just what that disparity in strength looks like. And we're just moving on. I don't even want to bring myself to see what happens next because if it's And he's probably going to go to something completely different. Just teasing it. Ah. It annoys me because God damn, is he doing a good job of writing well? Ah. Basically my bitching aside, this is really well done. It's great writing. It has a lot of, techniques implemented incredibly well and i've heard the fan is making a comic if anyone could let me know where to find that let me know i'd appreciate it or if he has a physical book or if someone printed out a physical book of the first dozen chapters as a hey here's the first volume of this story he wrote i would like that because frankly this is so incredibly cool as a well done physical picture book as something he could sell i don't even know if that's legal at that point i don't even care it would be really cool i doubt it but it'd be awesome Basically, what I'm saying is there's a link below to the original video. Hit it up. If you like this, subscribe. Let me know if there's anything I missed. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.